Okay, so this will be my third time. This will be my third time giving this lecture, and I am so sorry. I, um, when I decided to try to use Noteball, I figured that it would be um, a more compatible and easier to use system. However, the last two lectures, there's been problems with the application where my lectures have not been posted, and um, I can see them, but you can't. So I'm very sorry for this, and we, we are working on it. So let's try Origins of Theater Dance, take three. Okay, so let's go ahead and move right into screen share. Okay. And we'll start with the cradle of Western civilization. So because this, this, we're not just talking about all of dance, we're really trying to specify into Western theatrical dance, concentrating mostly on what's happening in America and what has happened in America. However, it's important to take note that most of our dance has been influenced by dances all over the country. In particular, we're looking in, in theater dance, ballet really is sort of the, the basis of theater dance. You can, I always think of ballet sort of like piano. You know, piano is, you have the piano and you have the classical reading of the notes. Well, ballet is similar in that it's um, jazz, modern, everything has kind of, everything except maybe tap dance has been based or rebelled against or had something to do with ballet. And ballet has to do with the cradle of Western civilization. So during the time of the silk trade, um, there was a lot of intermixing and there was a lot of like different showings of folk dances and folk dance steps and social dancing. So the role of geography has played an incredibly important role in the exchange of ideas in art, culture, and in dance. All right, for example, here's a Greek amphitheater in Sicily. So when the Romans overtook Greece, they also were very enamored with the Greek culture. Their, um, they, really, they really did um, epitomize culture and society and art during that time. I was fortunate enough to go to Greece last summer for a dance history um, conference and and it's true, the Greeks really, um, they really believe also that they are the founder of Western civilization. So speaking of Greek, what I like to think of when I think of history, and in particular dance history, is um, Apollo and Dionysian. I feel like there's these Apollonian forces and these Dionysian forces that help shape history and culture. So Apollo is considered to have dominion over music, dance, poetry, healing, reason, and intellectualism. So you can see here, and you look at the temple to, uh, to Apollo, you can see all of the order, the perfect square, the orderliness of the exact, the exact amounts in between the pillars, okay? So it's very, very much codified. And when we look at, and we look at some of the sculptures and paintings that were um, celebrating Dionysus, who was Apollo's half-brother, it's he's representing this wine intoxication these uh, sort of I um, just just craziness this more crazy chaotic feeling okay of just you know uh, I like to sometimes I think of it as like a, a rave or something you know just like crazy just people dancing and uh, it's very chaotic okay so we have these these energies of chaos and newness and starting something and Apollo of, of codifying, of controlling, of order, ordering something. So that's how I like to look at dance as well. Here's some of the, here's some of the paintings that show both the Apollonian and the Dionysian. So the Dionysian revels in the Dithyram. The Dithyram was this sort of, um, it was like a rave. You know, just this crazy dance, dance all night, drink wine. And then we have the line dances and the very orderly circle dances. Down in the wedding dance, there's um, a very Apollonian dance. 
And then Rome came. We're gonna we're gonna go through we're gonna go through this part of history quite quickly just to get us into um, what we know as theater dance now. But it is important to realize that each of these civilizations have contributed to the um, making of theater dance that we know of today. So Rome, um, when they conquered the Greeks, like I said, they were very they very much loved the Greek culture and their Greek marble, and they imported a lot of that into what is now Italy. Okay. And so the Romans, they sort of let the Greeks do their thing. They copied some of it. They built some structures that looked like the Greek amphitheaters. And then they started doing their own types of theatrical expression. And what Ro the Romans brought into theatrical expression was comedy, exotic displays, and great circus spectacles. So they had chariot races, gladiators. Um, they also, what was funny to me when I was reading about the Roman actors would wear these comedic a uh, masks. And down here in the corner, he's got a stick. So slapstick comedy actually came from the Roman theater. So they would, um, they when they were making noises, like they were going to hit someone to fall down, the stick had like a flap on it, and it would make the slap, slap noise. And so that's where we get the slapstick comedy from. we have and then we have these sort of Dionysian energies coming up and shaking up what had been very ordered between the Greeks and the Romans and the fall of the Roman Empire comes and then we start to establish and codify the Christianity now during the fall of the Roman Empire and that establishment there was a lot of uh, more Dionysian type dancing okay dance mania where they would dance all night um, some of the some people believe that they, if they were getting the plague or the plague was coming near if they they could dance all night they would sort of like sweat it out or they wouldn't get sick tarantism this was a was a dance about a spider bite and so there's some historians that wonder if it was the spider the poison that made them kind of crazy and move move chaotically or if it was uh in replication or of that idea so that's um so this is sort of this uh, Dionysian revelry that's happening. And then as we, we move forward through the Dark Ages into the 1500s, we're starting to codify again, and we have more um, class structures. So we have you know, a royal class and the peasant class and these strong families. And the, and the papacy has been, has been codified as well. So we get into the um, court spectacles of the 15th and 16th century. They were composed of music and dance. And this, was very, this is the very beginning of ballet. So they would take these folk steps and make them more intricate and slow them down. And there would be these elaborate displays. However, it's important to realize that the very first ballet, this period of time, there were no women in ballet. So the ballets were all done by men. And sometimes the men would dress up like women and they would make, have these stories. Um, but it was all men, and it was a very, it was a show of power and a display of prowess if you were a man and you were good at this dancing. So it was very elaborate court entertainment. Okay, and the very first ballet was, is considered to have been done in 1581. It was produced by Catherine de' Medici, who was a very prominent family at the time. They were, um, controlled the papacy, and they had a lot of power in Italy. And she was marrying her niece to Henry of France, and that was also another power play to kind of uh, join forces with France and Italy. And so in order to celebrate this and to show off the um, important cultural, uh, I don't know how to say it, the important cultural uh, sophistication that Italy had, she, she commissioned uh, Balthasar de Bougelier to choreograph the Ballet Comique de la Reine. So he was an Italian dancing master, and he, it was the very first time that they put on stage, instead of just dancing, you know, almost like social folk dancing in the courts, he actually was going to choreograph set steps to a story, and the subject matter was mythological. He was intended to flatter the French and the visiting nobilities, and also to remind the guests that the Medicis of Florence, Italy, still controlled Europe and the papacy. So as I said, it was performed by the men of the court. Women of the day were not meant to be on stage. So the gentlemen who were successful in the court were also expected to be good at fencing, accomplished in musical matters, and this is funny that I read this, and able to dance the minuet without tripping. 
Now this moves us into, so as the, everybody was enamored with the ballet Comique de la Reine, and they, uh, they continued to start producing in France and in Italy to keep producing these choreographed set ballets to stories. And that brings us into the time period of ballet decor. So that is the late 1500s to around 1640s, okay? And these, again, all performed by men. The ballet decor, what, they, what it brings in is uh, more choreography. They slowed it down. Um, they added in some minuets and some jigs. They had these elaborate costumes, and that's really why they had to slow it down because the, they have these, you can see in the pictures here, these giant headdresses. So they slowed it down, and they made the posturing more upright, okay? Uh, female roles were played by boys, and only the men performed. So for at least 100 years of ballet, there were no women, which is very different than how we... Um, think of ballet today. So you can again the erect posture, the elegant presentation, uh, putting in more of these old folk dance movements. And that brings us to King Louis the Fourteenth. Now, the King Louis the Fourteenth is very funny, I think, in the in ballet history. Not only is he pivotal in how we see and talk about ballet today, some of the reasons why is. It was quite egocentric. So King Louis the Fourteenth, as you can see, has his leg outstretched here, showing off his large calf muscle. So at the time, back then, having a large calf muscle was akin to what we see today with um, maybe maybe the social of the aesthetic of the male body today would be strong ab abdominal muscles, you know, a six pack or something, or big shoulders, a big upper body. But back then it was having a big calf muscle. So in most pictures, and I, and I um, encourage you to look some up, he's always show he's showing off his calf muscles. So he loved to dance. He danced every single day for 20 years. He decided that he loved dancing so much that he wanted to open up the very first dancing school. So that in 1661, King Louis XIV opened up the very first dance school, which was established in the Western world. And he gave um, private, he had private lessons by Pierre Beauchamp. And what King Louis XIV did and what he's most known for is he codified all of this terminology because he figured that if he wanted to have this art form prevail, um, have it be able to be taught from one dancing master to the next dancing master that he had to establish the five positions of ballet and then he and then he named each of the steps in French um, and then they wrote them down and that's how they were able to pass on knowledge from master to student who becomes master to student and master to student and therefore and so on. So you can see this evolution is becoming very Apollonian. We're starting to really make rules and orders about how ballet is going to be performed. So he loved to, uh, King Louis XIV also loved to uh, appear on stage and be the star of his ballets. So uh, he was a fencing master. He did the five basic positions of the feet. And so this was able to to add in more intricate movements. So we see the evolution going from folk dancing to this, you know, we had the chaos of the fall of the Roman Empire, then we had the stratification of uh, social, social society, socioeconomic society, and in that stratification, we started bringing in folk dancing and making it more sophisticated and performance-wise in the courts. And then from the evolution of the court dancing, we had the first ballet in 1581 to be performed on a stage um, for the marriage of the Medici niece and Henry IV, and that keeps moving into King Louis XIV, who now has codified ballet and made the very first dancing school. So this is all very important when we look at ballet in present day. So as, um, as this started happening, women started dressing up like men so that they could also be on stage and do the dancing. So um, finally, uh, Pierre Novaire decided that he would write these letters about how theater really should be, and he said we should get rid of the masks. And when in getting rid of the masks, they found that there were females on stage as well, and that became uh, more accepted at that time. 
So um, 17th century, the mask began to disappear and talented women began to take the stage. The very first woman to take the stage was Madame La Fontaine. She was the first female dancer to appear on the Rasta of the Paris Opera. So we're really starting to codify theaters and performers and make it into what more of what we see how it is today. And then, she, then because of the schools that Louis XIV began, schools started popping up all over. And we had um, Francois Prevost, who was a ballerina, and then she then taught Marie Camargo and Marie Salé. So Marie Camargo and Marie Salé were very, um, they were uh, very important to, to uh, women being on stage and to what happens with the skirts and what they were showing. So Marie Camargo was the first person to be able, or first female to be able to do an entrechocat, which is where you jump in the air and you cross your feet four times in the air. So it goes front, back, front, back, down. Okay. And so she was a very good dancer. So then she decided that she was going to shorten her ballet skirt to prove that her virtuosity was equal to her male colleagues. Now, Marie Salé was known for her expressive and dramatic performances rather than her leaps and frolics. And so she really added in the use of the upper body, which is known as the port de bras. So she really began to use her upper body to show the more expressive side of what ballet could be. So when you marry those two uh, females together, they were dancing about the same time. Uh, they, they really were pivotal in making the skirts shorter and to allowing more movement in the upper body. This brings us into the 18th century and the ballet de action. So what happens here is um, they, so we have the, the jumps are becoming more complicated. The upper body is becoming more expressive. Nover decides that we should get rid of um, the mass and called for dances to suit the character being portrayed. So they start doing more themed dances around real people instead of these mythological creatures that are about what, ha what, you know, what would happen. And so the, one of the very first ballets that is actually one of the, it was the first ballet I ever saw at the San Francisco Ballet, La Fille Mal Gardée, which literally translates as the young girl badly guarded. And it's a funny ballet because it's a, sort of a sign of the time as dance often is reflected in what is happening culturally. This uh, young woman was supposed to marry this man who she did not love, and she loved this other man, or young man, and so she grabs the young man and takes him into this barn and where they, where they are then found uh, by the mother, who at that point, she's like, oh, my daughter's been compromised, and so now she has to marry this young man, and there's a big celebration and a dance because she's very happy that she gets to marry the guy she really wanted to. So that's, that's the, that dance. But what, what is important about this dance is that it started to show human characters in human, human positions, and it started to really make the dancing more complicated, okay? So they're having much uh, more sophisticated jumps and footwork. Uh, the slipper, they're all using slippers now. The clogs were removed, and so the heeled clogs were removed. And so this is really turning it into what we know as ballet today. And that's where we come into, so they had the ballet slippers. You can see on the second, the second um, picture from the left, that's the ballet slipper. And then um, during the French Revolution, this is also I found very interesting, um, the, the Charles, I can't pronounce his last name very well, so I'm just not going to, but um, had introduced the concept of a flying machine in 1794. He presented it in London in 1796. And this contraption allowed dancers to stand very briefly, like using um, harnesses and strings would lift them up. So it would portray the, um, this illusion of lightness and um, ethereal, okay, which is in, you'll see these themes in a lot of classical ballets. And so now um, Filippo Taglioni, who was an Italian teacher, was teaching his daughter Marie Taglioni, and he decided to work with someone to develop um, a dancer going up onto the tips of their toes with the use of these hardened ballet shoes that allows the dancer support to go up onto full point. So in 1832, Marie Taglioni, 
was the first dancer to dance on point in the ballet La Sylphide. Now she was a very tall, modest young woman, and her father felt like her lines were too long when she extended her arms all the way. So he told her to slightly bend her elbows. And she would, because she was such a uh, high, she had such high moral standards. She always had long dresses and something covering her shoulders. And you'll see today that she sort of, she epitomized and started the whole romantic ballet uh, genre, which is still reproduced by dancers today in large companies throughout the world. All right, we're going to go ahead and close this out. Maybe. Okay, and we'll bring in the next, which brings us into the Romantic Ballet. Romanticism. Romanticism, searching for the unattainable, often has um, themes of ethereal and um, earthy romanticism was found in several writing and painters and musicians at the time. And so the ideals of supernatural themes and exotic locales will, is a one way for you to recognize a romantic ballet. So it's my goal that you will be able to go to a ballet anywhere across the world and have some understanding about the historical implications and what it is you're watching. Okay, so if you go to a romantic ballet and you see longer white skirts, like a chiffon, longer white chiffon skirts, you see slightly bent porta bra, which again we learned came from Marie Taglioni's long arms. However, because she was um, such, a, such a rising star, and all the ballerinas wanted to um, imitate those gestural things. She was sort of famous ballet to go up on point shoes. So we have um, the expressive potential of the point shoe. The point shoe is becoming more and used more and more often in romantic ballet. That's when we first start seeing them is romantic ballet. And uh, you'll also have these like sort of weird supernatural themes. So the ballet I'm going to show you now is called Giselle, which is was my favorite ballet to perform because it's so much fun. But the the story is really not feminist friendly. So the the young girl of of the village. She's a peasant girl, and she goes out to pick flowers in the forest, and she runs into a young man, and they fall in love, and he asks her to marry him, and she says yes, and she runs back to the village to tell her mother that she's found the man of her dreams, and a young man who also lives in the village and is a peasant, whose name is Hilarion, which I wonder if that's where we get hilarious, but his name is Hilarion. He is upset because he knows that the the man that he, she has fallen in love with is an imposter, that he's actually part of, of the royalty and is already engaged. And so he blows this big horn to call the royalty into the, into the village, and the royalty comes and parades into town, and uh, a woman of wearing a purple dress and very royal with a giant ring says, what are you doing here dressed like a peasant? I mean, she says that with her mannerisms. And he says, oh, I'm so sorry. Well, Giselle sees this and sees that he, she's actually been tricked, okay? And so in some, in the older versions, the ones that would have been performed in around 1841 when it was choreographed, um, she stabs herself in the heart. Now, that sometimes is, rubs people the wrong way these days, and so now she dies of a broken heart. She goes crazy first, and then she dies. And then she joins the um, faction of women known as Willies, and the willies are all jilted women who have died of a broken heart or have been left at the altar, and they wear white, and they come out at night in the forest, and they dance men to death. And I thought that was so much fun, being a willie. So I'm going to show you where Hilarion comes into the forest, and uh, Myrta and the other queen willies dance him to death. And we're going to watch that. Here we go.
Oh, come on. Oh, this is just making me nuts. There we go. So there's Hilarion. The Willies are saying, oh, you are stuck here. There's the queens. Notice the long white skirts. The small jumps. Now they're going to chase them down. The shoulders are covered. This is all inspired by Marie Taglioni. That's my favorite part. They're walking at him, and they're going to say, You die now. Soft bent arms, soft quarter bras. Says it again, you're gonna die right now, and we're gonna take you away. There it is. I noticed this. Notice the soft port de bras here, the bent, slightly bent, and they're going to do little intricate jumps. That's very indicative of romantic ballet. So let's go back. So. Here's some pictures of uh, some of the four fa most famous romantic ballerinas. So, of course, there's Marie Taglioni in La Sylphide. So she's a sylph, again, supernatural, ethereal themes. She's a sylph visiting a Scottish Highlander, and he's the only one who can see her, and they have this, they're in love, and they have this thing going on. And then we have um, Fanny Elsler and Carlotta Grisi. And Giselle, 1841, that would have been the, that was when it was choreographed. And Fanny Chirito. So then, Jules Perrault in 1845. Now, mind you, these dancers were akin, they were similar to how we see maybe pro athletes today. Okay, so very famous, very sought after, uh, very successful women at this time. And very, uh, very different than how we see ball ballerinas today as like starving artists. These were the it the it athletes of the day and so they were so famous that Jules Perrault decided to bring in all of the four most famous ballerinas and he does uh, a ballet that really is the epitome of romantic ballet and we're not going to watch that today because I'm running out of time and speaking of I have to teach ballet soon so we're going to keep moving forward uh, of course, there were men who were also studying ballet. We we're just talking about women um, in the 1800s because that's really when they, they came into their own and became very influential 
and sort of the stars of, of the ballet. However, the men were, men were just as important, okay? This is just some of, we're not gonna go into this. This is more for like a dance history class, but uh, we have all of these. It was, it's interesting though, that even though the women were becoming more prominent in ballet, the men really still were the choreographers of the time. So we had August Bournonville, Arthur St. Leon, and uh, Gautier, who was not a choreographer, but he was a, he was he was involved very involved with dancers at the time. So the choreographer we're going to focus most on out of these is Marius Petipa, and we're going to stop there for today. And I will um, I I pray my fingers are crossed. I really really hope that you were able to see this um, lecture today. I will be doing another lecture on Friday, and I'm hoping that with this new uh, academic platform, uh, we can get some of these bugs worked out and you can have a successful, you can have a successful, um, so with this new academic platform, I'm hoping we get some of these bugs worked out and that we can have a successful rest of the semester. I'm hopeful that that's going to happen. So I will continue with ballet history part two on Friday. It'll be at noon. And um, if anybody is available, you can come on, you can um, ask questions. You can't, we won't be live together, but you can go to the question and answers and ask questions. So on that, I hope you have a lovely Wednesday and Thursday, and I'll see you Friday. And I really hope this works. Please email me if you have any questions. <laughs>